recollections are upon us. If only that implied that reflection was upon us. I'm sitting here worried about who's next up in this office. I said this was locker room talk. Uh, I'm not proud of it. I apologize to my family. I apologize to the American people. Certainly, I'm not proud of it. That was a mistake, and I take responsibility for using a personal email account. Repealing all of the executive orders that Barack Obama has signed that are stifling economic growth in this economy. Donald Trump wrote a book, and he said Social Security is a Ponzi scheme. If you come in from China, you see these incredible airports, and you land, we've become a third world country. How do we have better public policy that's based on empirical evidence rather than anecdotes? What will you do to make sure that the U.S. meets the agreements from the Paris Climate Accords? And how will we make sure that those benefits from greener energy and more environmentally friendly practices don't only benefit the most privileged among us? How will you boost resources to America's mental health services? And how will you guarantee equal access for everyone? Studies show that when parents can spend more time with their children, we see better outcomes. What are your plans to improve paid parental leave? And my question for the presidential candidates is, how are you going to improve the provision of care for mental health as well as reduce the stigma surrounding it? What will you do as president to those who are stuck in the middle, making too much money to receive federal subsidies, but also not being able to afford the rising costs of health care? What will you do to make sure that everyone has access to science education? Not just young people, but adults as well. Today, a victory for evidence-based politics with California Governor Jerry Brown signing a mandatory school vaccination bill that eliminates a personal belief exemption. So this is why we're in favor of science, because science saves lives. Thank you everyone so much for coming to uh, YouTube space today for this taping of The Young Turks. We're so grateful to have a space that we can talk about science and its role in uh, these elections. Now, as you know, there hasn't been a lot of really meaningful questions asked in this election, and this is a really great opportunity to do so. So everyone in the audience and everyone watching at home, if you could please use the hashtag vote for science, number four, vote for science, and maybe we'll have an opportunity to change the debate and ask some really meaningful questions while we still have the chance. I'd like to thank the organizers today, in particular, Nancy Holt. Nancy, can we have a round of applause for her? We also want to thank YouTube, who have been the ho home of the Young Turks for more than 10 years, and in particular, the YouTube space in New York, who have been our home in the East Coast for two years, and they give us a great opportunity. Uh, we are able to host PsyQ, the science show, here in YouTube space. So without them, we wouldn't be able to talk about science on the Young Turks. So we're very grateful. So round of applause for YouTube. Now, science has a great friend in John Iderola, who's flown all the way over from Los Angeles to be here in New York City with us tonight. Now, I know that John is a massive science nerd on the inside. Not only does he host the show Think Tank, but he is also, uh, I was with him two weeks ago when we were taping for Fusion. And he was given an opportunity in a segment called Hot Takes to talk about any topic he wanted to. He could have talked about politics. He could have talked about sex scandals. He could have talked about money in politics. But what he chose to talk about was the fact that panda bears, the iconic logo of environmental conservation, were now off the endangered species list yet orangutans and chimpanzees had moved to critically endangered. So we know that if, when given an opportunity, a guy who talks about the environment is always going to be a friend of science and a friend of ours. So a round of applause for John Iderola. Uh, so again, I want to reiterate what Jade said. Thank you uh, for coming. It's awesome to see an audience uh, that wants to talk about both politics and science, that usually either one of those would cut half of the audience out of any group of Americans. So it's, it's encouraging to see all of you coming out here. Uh, we are going to be talking about the intersection of those two things. We have two panels for you uh, tonight for two IT interviews. Uh, the first one's going to be a little bit more focused on the media angle. Uh, later on, we're going to be digging a little bit deeper into some actual policy. Uh, but this is extremely important for two reasons. First, from the science angle, it's uh, effectively impossible, if you stop and think about it as you go through your day, to avoid going from one interaction with the products of scientific uh, progress to another. 
And yet, on a personal level, we don't often think about that. We don't think about the fact that we are literally walking on the shoulders of giants wherever we go, especially in a city like New York. And on a governmental level, it's very difficult to think of a government policy that doesn't uh, have an effect on science or isn't informed on some level by science. And yet again, we don't often think about that. And certainly politicians don't talk about it. When was the last time you heard science uh, come out of the mouth of uh, Donald Trump? Maybe it's for the best. Uh, but we don't hear it a lot. And so we're going to try to make that connection and make it a little bit clearer here uh, today. Uh, because after all, uh, it's impossible to forget that in just three weeks we have an election that seems a little bit more consequential than usual, actually. And, uh, and so a couple of great organizations have brought us together to uh, delve into some of these topics. So I want to thank uh, sciencedebate.org, uh, YouTube, of course, uh, literally the chairs we're sitting on provided by them, uh, the Science and Education Policy Association, the Union of Concerned Scientists and Research America as well. We're going to be looking at uh, the connection between what the candidates think about policy and how they would actually govern if they become the most powerful person in the world. But I'm not going to be doing most of that. That's the majority of the talking I'm going to do. They're going to be doing the talking. This awesome panel that we've got, and so I want to introduce them. Uh, first up, we've got uh, Chuck Nice, a uh, comedian, actor, and uh, host of Star Talk Radio, which you might have heard of. Uh, so that should be awesome. Yeah. Uh, Nomi Kans is here as well. I hope you've heard of it. <laughs> I mean, if you like I science, I hope you've heard of it. I hope you've heard of me. You probably don't know my co-host at all. His name is Neil deGrasse Tyson, but I'm sure, I'm sure that's falling on he's deaf ears up. right now. So give it a few years. Yeah, uh, he's at, going places. At some point, he's gonna make it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> uh, I hope he runs for president. I would love that. Uh, Nomi, uh, great point. Also, Nomi Kans is going to be here. Uh, so, uh, political activist, uh, gone to jail for that political activism. Uh, political advocate and also the host of The Filter on Sirius XM Progress. Uh, CBS News contributor and uh, one of the most prominent Bernie surrogates from this uh, past primary election. So, Ooh. welcome Hi. Nomi as well. <laughs> <laughs> We also have uh, some of the best representatives of uh, science on YouTube as well. So Aaron Carroll, host of the extremely popular and uh, scientifically serious uh, YouTube channel, Healthcare Triage. Hey. So uh, thank you for joining us. <laughs> and extremely exciting. So as far as I know from our research, the only person to ask a science-based question at a presidential uh, debate so far this cycle Emily Eller, and uh, so you did that. You're also the host of uh, Minute Earth on YouTube as well. <laughs> Which we have never met, but I've been watching those videos for what feels like years at this point. So <laughs> awesome to have you here as well. And so lots of, of topics to get to. Why don't we jump into one? Uh, so like I said in that intro, uh, politics and science uh, connect in so many different ways. And that link is very rarely made. It's almost never made by actual politicians. You have a couple of responsible, scientifically minded politicians that do it from time to time, but very few want to talk about it. It almost feels like if there's a wall between church and state, the wall between state and academia is 10 times as thick. And you're more likely to hear them talk about God than gravity on any given day. And, uh, so there's a lot of issues that that connection is there, but it doesn't get talked about. So as a way of uh, drawing you guys out, what is a topic where you feel that connection is strong but not talked about? Where you feel like politics and science, uh, that connection should be stronger, perhaps in this election, perhaps on any given year. Uh, what, are some, what are some things that, that uh, leap in well, your mind? What, what immediately comes to mind is, is climate change. And uh, it probably is, with, with, without, without very little uh, um, of friction. It is probably the most pressing issue that is facing us as humankind. And it affects everyone. That's, yeah. that's what's so funny, is that it affects us all. The problem is that politically, it is tied to a great deal of money. Mm -hmm. It is tied to not only a great deal of money, but a great deal of money being lost by a very few people. And those few people take every opportunity and take all their effort to make sure that they can influence the conversation as much as possible so that we don't actually do anything about it. Yeah. And so obfuscation is the big play of the day when it comes to climate change, which by the way, if you notice, we now call it climate change. Mm -hmm. We used to call it global warming. And that didn't do anything to anybody. 
<laughs> like people were just like, who cares? I live in Minnesota. <laughs> Global warm is not a bad deal. I would like a warmer January, but people don't know. <laughs> people didn't understand that that meant that, you know, that there was going to be billions of dollars in treasure and blood lost yeah. because we are now headed towards that two degrees Celsius uptick that will really bring about complete devastation on a worldwide level. Yeah. And no one talks about it because it's a money thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you think, Nomi? I mean, thank you for saying that because as somebody who works in politics, it is incredibly frustrating when you're on the left and even the left doesn't address this issue. So you have a landscape right now where money is ruling politics. I mean, it's been brought up so many times in this election cycle, but it has become the tool so that you can't have a complete conversation about climate change. We have a presidential debate where the question, the one question by Ken Bone, you know, famous Ken Bone, <laughs> the one question that was asked about energy and climate was about jobs and energy. And it was about transitioning from one poor product to another poor product, rather than saying, what are your solutions to combat climate change? And I believe part of that is because, you know, it is money. It's not just the, the money that's influencing uh, the studies. The fact that institutions that are doing studies on climate change are, are being funded by corporations that don't want to have studies that show that climate change is, is a serious issue and that time is running out. The media that's being funded by these corporations that don't want that. You know, if CNN, I, I, I would dream of a day when CNN changed those countdown clocks from countdown <laughs> to the next debate or conversation about, to countdown until the abyss. Countdown <laughs> until, you know, right. the next hurricane. Right. Or countdown. I think the next debate might be the abyss, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Good point. But, you know, we had a hurricane of uh, what, was, what was perceived to be uh, the largest hurricane to hit southeastern uh, uh, America and the Caribbean in over 10 years, right? We didn't talk about that in the last debate. Hurricane Matthew, not a bit, not once. You had millions of people displaced from their homes. Over a thousand people died in Haiti, not to mention the fact that there's a cholera outbreak about to come out and people are being displaced. Not to mention that every single time some sort of climate change disaster occurs, it's not just people in impoverished communities anymore and communities of color anymore, it's communities all over the planet, including yeah. New York City. So it's not just that yeah. it, it will take money out of the pockets of these corporations. I, I think that the conversation needs to switch, and I hope that Hillary Clinton, who I believe will be the next president, I really hope that she can sit there and say, the amount of money that these corporations is gonna lose, that they're gonna lose, is, it pales in comparison to the amount of money that this global economy is, is, is it's gonna be crushed. If we thought that 2008 was bad, wait until more climate change disasters occur. Florida's underwater. We've seen it with New Orleans. We've seen it in, in, in New York. You just can't keep up. The cost is, the, the, the physical cost is obviously significant. But if that's not working, the financial cost. And you see places like China evolving, because they realize that. It's yeah. pronounced China. 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 Their, their airports are great. But they're investing. And, yeah. and, 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 and that's where the conversation, I think, needs Absolutely. to switch. Yes. Obviously, incredibly important topic. You libs with your climate change talk. But if you guys can hit up something other than climate yes, change, so it's like, I mean, it's that hard would to argue awesome. against climate change being right. utterly important and everything else. But, you know, sticking closer to home. If you trust 97% um, of scientists. Yeah, exactly. But for me, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm much more, I'm always concerned about how we address health and health policy. Um, and it feels like too often, especially in the media and when it gets to politics, it still becomes a he said, she said, or a, you know, two sides argument. Yeah. And it drives me crazy because. Uh, it's one thing to say, like, we, we haven't done good research or we don't know what this will do, but to, to act as if we have no idea what health policy means or what changes will do or how changes to this or that might actually affect outcomes, it gets ignored all the time. Yeah. And we treat arguments about health policy and often even medicine as political arguments, as like, well, this side says this and this side says that, without being able to understand that there are often dispassionate third parties who, who do good work who can give better answers. And if we followed those answers, we might get a better healthcare system, we might get better health, we might even you know, just be happier and, and more healthy. But that gets lost in the noise. And so many of the arguments, if, if health or health policy gets addressed in the election, it's just should we repeal Obamacare or should we pretend that everything is fine and just move forward? And we're, making, we're having the same arguments about something passed four years ago without ever discussing how, we, how might we move forward. Exactly, yeah. What do you think, Emily? 
Well, I, so I'd love to give a different answer, but <laughs> given that climate change was like the one thing that we decided to ask about when given an opportunity at the primary, I think that's, I mean, that, that is sort of the, and, and I think that we are, our thinking at the time, which was naive, was that, um, you know, if we could get, if we could push the conversation a little bit further, and there's, I was reading recently that this, and this is surprising, that, that politicians actually deliver on most of their campaign promises. So mm -hmm. the idea that we were, we were thinking, you know, they're going to say, oh yeah, climate change, we totally agree, but if we could actually point out, hey, um, we signed this Paris Peace Accord, we're the, the climate change accord, and we're only going to, in our you know, current policies, or Obama's plan that Hillary said, like, I love it, let's stick with that, you know, that's only going to go 50% of the way there. Yeah. Um, so if we could yeah. find a way to, you and, and, um, in the end, though, I mean, even that question during the, the primary debate was like the response from the politicians on stage was, oh, the debate's over. You know, you're talking to a bunch of people on stage who understand that. But it's, it's so I would say that pushing that conversation a little bit further and pointing yeah. out that we're not actually anywhere close, even the people who are saying that. Even if we do follow the plan. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. 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 No, great information. Although I do find it suspicious that none of you mentioned, and I heard this in the last debate, they have clean coal now. Yes. No. Yeah. no! I feel like we should look into exactly. that. It's coal and right. clean. And you know how they clean coal? Unicorn farts. <laughs> you just filter it right yeah, through you there. you filter it right through. Okay. Like you feed a unicorn coal and it comes out clean. Yeah. It's still dark, but it's not as bad. Uh, okay, so I want to switch it up a bit to uh, the media. Okay, uh, all of you are in various forms of media. I'm going to ask this to you, Nomi. So I know you, uh, you showed up on CBS News amongst other networks throughout the primary. And uh, you were asked a lot of questions on panels such as this. And um, I imagine a spectrum of how substantive a question is, where like science policy is over here, uh -huh. any policy at all is here, uh -huh. and then day-to-day -day BS about the campaign and personalities and all that is right there. So in your experience, uh, do we focus too much in the media on personality over policy, especially science policy? Or did you have some opportunities to talk about the more substantive issues during your experience of the primary? I will say. Normally, duh, yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's all personality, especially right now. But there was something very, and, and granted, I was a Bernie surrogate. I didn't start off as a Bernie surrogate. I was working in a nonpartisan news organization, and then I said, screw this. This is an amazing opportunity. Bernie Sanders was able to talk. He made a, a, a form of conversation because he was a, a presidential candidate. He was able to talk about things that previously I wasn't capable of talking about on air. You just weren't, you, you couldn't touch it. You couldn't call out corporations, really. You couldn't talk about campaign finance reform. You couldn't uh, talk about reforming the Democratic Party, which is still something that I can't really talk about because they're the good guys, right? <laughs> and Donald Trump. The better guys. The better, right. I mean, and, but that's, that's, that's the way my that bias. they portray Sorry. it. So I think what was, and, and climate change, fracking, fracking, you know, clean coal. These, these are issues that I wasn't able to present uh, before Bernie Sanders entered the race. So I think something different happened in this election, and I know a lot of people are very depressed that uh, progressives are very depressed that he didn't make it, and, and they're depressed that Donald Trump is, is you know, the Donald nominee. Trump. Donald Trump. But the reality is, is that the conversation was diverse this election cycle. There was a lot of, of crap also, but we have to remember that uh, there was an array of issues that were never discussed before. Yeah, you know, that's true. Hillary Clinton was pressured on issues that and I wouldn't say by the media, I think it was by the, the, the people who are on the other side, saying things like, well, okay, Hillary Clinton, you believe in climate change, that's great. So do most Americans, or so do most people in the world, so do pretty much all scientists. Uh, why are you still accepting money from oil and gas industry executives? Why is it that on the platform committee, which we were talking about earlier, the Democratic platform committee, we had this unity amendment basically acknowledging that fracking is not a great thing, and that we are against it as a party. It wasn't the strongest amendment, but it was better than nothing. And then a couple of days later, you have a one of the largest fundraisers with natural gas executives. So I think those are the questions the media needs to start asking. It's not going to tear down the candidate. It's not going to lose them the election. But really, it's about priorities. And if there is no space to have really honest conversations about climate other than I don't believe in climate change, and I do believe in climate change, but I'm still accepting money from these interests over here, and we're going to gradually acknowledge it. There's no gradual when it comes to climate change. We all know that yeah. here. Yeah. There's, a, there's a countdown clock. 
To the abyss. To the abyss. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I want to turn to the two YouTubers. So okay. Emily and Aaron. Uh, so both of you, uh, in, in slightly different areas, on the earth, and the environment, or in health, uh, you educate people with your videos. Uh, and thanks to the internet, it's now easier for those to be quickly spread. I mean, if, it, if it's an awesome video, millions of people can see it in just a couple of weeks, theoretically. But at the same time, we also know that misinformation and conspiracy theories seem to be shared at a much faster rate than just hard scientific data. Uh, so as educators and communicators, how do you communicate about sometimes incredibly complex topics where people, they want the cozy comfort of simplicity and conspiracy theories provide that. There's one lizard person behind everything that happens in this universe. <laughs> so how do you communicate with people and make sure that the right information gets out there and fight against the wrong information? Well, so if it's on something that's politicized, I think that's a really good question. And I'm not sure that at Minute Earth we've, we've solved it. When we've, um, when we've tried to, to talk about scientific issues like vaccines that are going to be political for people, uh, our approach is generally that um, I think that scientists, you know, are, are smug when they talk about these things. There's, there's a lot of like, and people still believe vaccines, you know, and it's like, yeah, but people are, you know, scared and their moms and their dads and they, you know, and, and so I think that that has been what we've attempted to do is sort of reach out and be like, you're not crazy if you're scared, but, you know, fear is, is, is a weird thing. And so I think that's, you know, how we've, how we've dealt with politicized things. I'm not sure how much how much success we've had. Um, I'm sure that people who are already on our side were happy to see the video, but you know, it's, it's, it's hard to know, or hard, really hard to measure the impact yeah. of that. Okay. It's a battle worth fighting, and you're far more tolerant than well, me when it comes to those issues, yeah. by the way. <laughs> my, my day job, I am a scientist, so my, I try to swallow the smugness. But um, <laughs> no, so it's, uh, I think part of it is that, you know, when we try to tackle issues, and that, that's always a tricky one, vaccines and autism. I mean, it's just, it's so, that itself has become so polarized that you almost, it's one side or the other. Um, but when we're talking about a politically charged topic, or when I'm writing about a politi politically charged topic, I, I try very hard not just to tell you what I think, but why I think it. So uh, whether it's my columns or whether it's videos that we make, we take special care to actually try to go through the research and talk about why this research is different than that research, why this is good research, and why this is not optimal research, and to get people to understand why this is so, as opposed yeah. to just saying so. And if you walk people through it carefully enough, there are some people who will change their mind. Now, of course, there are some that will treat anything that you write, no matter what you say, as if it's an op-ed and it's just your opinion and that. And I'm amazed sometimes after taking you know, real time to construct a good argument and to back it up with almost all of the available you know, research yeah. that I can find, that it can still just get dismissed as that's your opinion. But I think it's very hard to keep, I mean, very important to keep trying to explain to people why science says something is so as opposed to try to just give them an answer. And, yeah. uh, and that's what we try to do. Yeah. Yeah, I know uh, you've probably experienced this when you're trying to educate people, that you, you put out an eight-minute video carefully crafted, and three minutes after its release, there's a lot of dislikes already. It's, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. it's weird how that works. I don't know. Time, it, relativity is a weird thing, I guess. Um, For me, I, I think, um, and thank God I'm not a professional or a scientist, so I can say this, <laughs> people are stupid. So, um, <laughs> no, I'm joking when I say that. But the truth of the matter is that I believe that part of what you all just talked about stems from our education system in America. And the fact that we are always defunding education and always defunding science on every level. Yeah. Okay, we are always defunding research, defunding NASA. It's like, it's, and, and, and when you look at our budget, when you look at our national budget, the money that's, all, that's going to science and education, NASA, you put it all together, and honestly, it's a blink. Like, mm -hmm. if you blinked, you would miss it. It is nothing, but yet, they still want to take a scalpel to it. Now, when you defund science, and when you defund science education, what you're really defunding is critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot study science without learning how to think critically. And as a result, when an argument is made, you say, well, I don't feel that way. Yeah. And I don't like the way what you said makes me feel. So I don't agree with you. And that's all there is to it. 
because Zika is a government plot. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you how we can use uh, comedy to communicate these issues, but you just answered it. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah. And thank you for bringing up uh, the funding, though, because it is frustrating when you see, I mean, back when I was in grad school, there would always be the, oh, God, did you hear they might be cutting, you know, uh, uh, grant funding and all that, right. and, it, and it's a little bit sad when we can put 10, 20 times as much money into firing rockets into Syria's rockets to Mars. But isn't that Our priorities are a bit messed up yeah, as a species, a, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, now, we do have a question uh, from someone in the audience. Uh, Matthew Chapman, the uh, president of sciencedebate.org. I can understand how uh, candidates don't want to talk about science because they have the fossil fuel industry that you know, doesn't believe in climate change and fundamentalists who don't believe in fossils. <laughs> um, you have a problem right there. But I don't understand why when we did a, a poll that found out that 85% of likely voters wanted candidates to discuss science and a big majority wanted an actual science debate, I don't understand why the media doesn't grab onto this amazing story of the fact that the public really does want this and the media isn't pushing it. You know, yeah. you have these debate moderators. I've written to every single one of them publicly. And they still ask these nitwit com questions that have nothing to do with the long-term health of the people or the planet. Well, you know, and I don't know if I'm actually qualified to answer this, but I have my observations. And they are only observations that have been taken because uh, I used to work for CNN and uh, M MSNBC, and I spent a lot of time in those, uh, in those studios, and I watched a lot of politicians come through and sit in the green room. And when you see the relationship yeah. between the network and the politicians, what you will quickly recognize is that I know that you don't know this, so Matthew, I'm about, I know you don't know this answer. I know I'm about to make you look like an idiot. And if I do that, you're not coming back here. You're going over there next time. And I need you back here because I need you to be in a split screen where I can throw somebody else up who has an opposing view and you guys can chirp back and forth and it becomes fodder for the uh, airwave of a coliseum that is just a basic crap storm uh, politically. And I am orchestrating that. And that, quite frankly, is why they don't do it. I can't embarrass you that way. Now, what I should do is say, hey, man, you got to learn something about science. Because <laughs> I'm going to ask you some science stuff. <laughs> like, that's what should happen. But they're not worried about that because that's yeah. not their responsibility as far as they're concerned. It's, it's you know, and, and being one of those people that has to argue the other side with, with those who deny climate uh, and science altogether, there are some stations that I won't name that will find some like little story. They'll be like, oh, did you see that the government was funding shrimps on shrimp on treadmills? And then suddenly <laughs> that's the debate around science and whether or not we should fund uh, you know, this specific study. Did you see that they had this big blowout party with all the executives from NASA? And now, oh, that's why we have to defund NASA. We should be privatizing this if we want to move forward. You know, th these are the conversations that are happening on one side, and then the conversations just aren't happening on other networks. Yeah. So you're either fighting to survive or you're just ignoring it because you want to get ratings. It's all about ratings. It's, it's about ratings. fighting, fighting, fighting. So if you don't have knowledgeable commentators, I mean, I've had to go on and debate things that I know nothing about. And I'm like, are you sure you want me to have? They'll tell me the topic five minutes before. They'll say, go and discuss uh, the no-fly zone in Syria. OK, I'll read a New York Times article, write down three points, and go debate that. <laughs> and then the other side doesn't debate it, or they have talking points. It's, it's theater. It's all, for the most part, you have professional politicians who are not delving into the issues. You have professional commentators who are also not delving into the issues. Very, it's very unusual that they have experts in that field because they want good ratings, they want people who are good on TV, they want people who speak in sound bites. They don't yeah. want a real diverse conversation. And I think there's a huge void. And there's a huge opportunity for more things like this to happen because we have shows that you guys have. Right. I mean, yeah. that's why people are going to you. Yeah. So, Jade, set them up more. So, <laughs> I, I would say, like, part of this is that 
it, all, the answers have all been about TV or specifically cable TV. And there's no question that's what cable TV is. And it's like mm -hmm. in the, the few instant, you know, the times I get called to be like, do you want to do this on CNN or anything else? Inevitably, it's we need someone to say X. Will you say X? And I say no. I will say what I think is right. And then they say thank you and they move on. And they also find out I live in Indianapolis, and that's the end of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, but it's, um, it's, it's. There are, there are other media sources, and I'd argue actually that other media sources are. It's like I mean, I write pretty regularly for the New York Times on specifically the things that I'm talking about. There's just so much stuff out there that you probably don't see. Either you see it or you don't, depending upon. You know whether it, it made it to the top of the heap that day yeah. or what else. And there's so much noise coming out about the election right now and the daily political grind that that stuff just gets washed away. And unless yeah. that becomes the topic of interest for whatever's going on in the election that day, it, it just gets washed away. But I think that there are other media sources that do cover science and things that are important. Well, I'd argue that there's also things that are independent and YouTube that yeah. cover those topics very well and very regularly. And they have an audience. It's yeah. just that audience has to be built and then people come there. It, it's very difficult to make it sort of penetrate the bubble and noise of everything that's going on right now yeah. with the election and whatever else yeah. is, is there. So it, those problems, I, I'd still argue, are very specific to cable news. And I wish we could find, get the energy at least to go look for other sources. Yeah. Well, YouTube is killing TV, but it would be nice yeah. if you guys could kill it just a little bit right. faster. Maybe before the next presidential <laughs> yeah. election. Also, to your point, I've always thought it was weird that you could have, uh, I'll be sitting and watching a debate, and no climate-related question will come up. In the primaries, there was one or two. No climate questions, and then they cut to a commercial break, and there's a BP ad. Yes. And that's not the weird thing. The weird thing is there's nothing you can buy in the ad. Right. I can't buy a barrel of oil from BP, <laughs> so why are they paying CNN all this money to run that ad? I'll introduce you to my oil guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I want oil, just in case. No, it's called propaganda. I hear the abyss is coming. It's called propaganda, and we don't realize it. You know, that uh, propaganda does not just have to come uh, from a government. I yeah. mean, uh, there is political propaganda that is promulgated by corporations all the time. And yeah. you say, BP, the one that kills me is Coke. Yeah. Coke has commercials where when the commercial's over, I'm just like, I, I, want, a cu I want a puppy and I want to <laughs> name it Coke. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what they're doing. Yeah. Because what they're trying- it's all feelings. What they're trying, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, water. right, water owned by Coke. Like what they're trying to do <laughs> is get you to be okay. Yeah. I, that's all they want. All I want you to be is okay with me. If yeah. you're okay with me, then I can pretty much do what I want, okay? But then when you recognize what they're actually doing, you're like, what the, what? <laughs> you know, and then that becomes, that's where, that's where activation happens. Yeah. That's where, that's where true activation happens. When you get past the warm and fuzzy commercial and you realize, whoa, these people are doing all kinds of really bad things to the environment in the name of a few dollars. Yeah. And by the way, it, they talk about the financial benefits of it, but it's really not financially beneficial because when it breaks down, it's actually one family, like five people in a family that are walking away with, oh, oh. <laughs> with all the money. Then you start to think like, yo man, something has to change about this. We gotta do something about this. And then some people show up and you start looking for drones. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're down to just the last few minutes of this panel. I have two questions I'd like to ask, but we'll see. This is like lightning round, I guess. So uh, I'm gonna throw this again to the YouTubers. YouTube has a younger audience. We all know that than the, the cable news channels and all that. Uh, it's likely that your audience is probably quite a bit younger than the people who are getting little dribbles of science news out of MSNBC. So the next generation, hopefully they will have a better relationship with science and politics than our current uh, generation. How do you go about communicating with uh, younger viewers, educating them? Is, do they reach out to you? Is there, are they different in what they want to be told or what they want to learn about? I don't know if they're different because I don't know what the older ones are like. Um, <laughs> they don't talk as much? I've never, I don't, uh, well, I've, when I've written for them, I, there's been no interaction. Um, I think that the, the way that we like to talk to them is that with the assumption that they're super smart people who are really curious and love to learn and that they really care about science. And so we can start with this assumption that they, that they actually want to 
know about science, which is not a, a position that a lot of traditional media starts from. They start from somewhere else. Like, if I don't tell you why this is going to change your whole life, then you're going to stop reading. So I think that we start with that, and then it's like we, it, I feel like there's, then you just have to be confident that this, the story that you're going to tell, because it's about science, is like, it's going to be really interesting. And I, I think that people respond well to that. Yeah. We don't change much, because um, I will often take the same topic, and, and if it's presented to different audiences, I will say that the audiences that I can tell from commenters are incredibly different at a place like the New York Times and a place like YouTube. Yeah. Um, and amazingly enough, my experience, for the most part, has been that YouTube people are way more polite. Um, really? <laughs> with the exception of like a few topics that clearly touched a nerve, and I was not expecting it, and woof, and then, and then it got all, it got bad. But it's, um, I want to hear about Part, this the difference, I think, is that with YouTube, it's, it's, it's building an audience. So it's the same people over and over and over again. When, when, I, when I have columns at the Times, it, the commenters are completely different every single time. Yeah. There might be hundreds or even a thousand, but they're, they're completely different people while the community of YouTube becomes much more consistent. Um, and even when we're doing a live show or when they're, they're interacting on social media, I, I will start to recognize people um, and I will start. So I think it, there's a chance to build a more longitudinal relationship uh, through YouTube and through videos, that you can bring people along and then try to educate them. But there's, there's, I don't think I treat them any differently, uh, in the sense that we we give them the same content, we speak to them as if they're intelligent and adults, and we try to lay out the same arguments, yeah. and, and it seems to work pretty well. Okay. Uh, final question then, for Naomi, I want to hear this. So we we've talked about how politicians uh, aren't generally very comfortable talking about science, or they don't think that there's benefit to talking about science. Uh, we also know that there's not a lot of scientists who ever run for electoral office. We know uh, if there are people in, co in Congress who have a science background, it's generally a bunch of doctors and the occasional astronaut. Uh, is the solution to get more scientists to run for office, uh, do you think? Yes and no. I mean, I think that there's different skill sets. I mean, I'm a firm believer, and, and Hillary Clinton would probably disagree with me on this, when she would always say, I'm not a politician, I'm not a skill. There's a reason why leaders have leadership traits. They can effectively communicate a message, distill those messages down. The problem, I think, is that we have too many salespeople in Congress. Mm. I mean, that's just the bottom line. They're really good at reading some talking points, delivering those talking points, uh, delivering them for their audience, but we don't have a lot of sophisticated politicians who can break... And, and I may not agree with all of his policies, but you know, obviously Bill Clinton was an effective communicator. I, I was watching a, a panel with President Obama just a couple of days ago where he, it was a science panel, and I was blown away by yeah. how much information he knew. Um, Joe Biden, I mean, the fact that he's researching cancer and can really get into the details, but he's able to effectively communicate it to a general audience. Now, being a skilled politician is also figuring out how to maneuver the halls of Congress and work with the other side, something I think you know, Bernie Sanders may not be the best communicator, but he was very good at delivering an hour and a half long speech and keeping a bunch of 19-year-olds engaged. <laughs> um, but he was also very good at passing uh, bills and legislation with Republicans, which I, I think that was lost in the conversation. He yeah. passed more legislation than any other Democrat in office. Um, so with that being said, science is a tool. Science is information. Science is something uh, it's not just that we need to fund science. I think there's an incredible amount of research being done um, across the board, whether it's uh, you know brain science or um, you know in, with NASA right now. The list goes on and on. It's the data and how you connect the data to policy. Government is behind, yeah. and the reason why government is behind is because politicians refuse to act because they're too busy fundraising and answering to their bases and yeah. their donors. And that's what I think the divide is. I'm glad that you ended up on the, them fundraising because when you said they're salespeople, I was like, yes, they are. And what they're selling is themselves to extremely wealthy people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which is unfortunate. Uh, so, oh, God, I have so many other great questions, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have. So I want to thank uh, the, the panel. You guys are great. Uh, Chuck and Nomi, Aaron and Emily. Uh, thank you so much. Um, imagine if this is what an hour on CNN was like. I think we'd all learn a little bit more if, if this is what Tina was like. Uh, so by and the way, guys, they'd cancel us. They probably. Yeah. Uh, it, by the way, guys. So if you want to uh, get engaged online, uh, there is the hashtag uh, Vote for Science, uh, where you can tweet out the topics you'd like to see politicians talk about, and especially tweet out the questions you'd like to see asked to politicians, because we've only got the one more debate. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot that they're going to be talking about with Trump that doesn't have to do with yeah. science, but hopefully they'll squeak in a couple more science questions. So uh, thank you, guys. Don't go anywhere. Another great panel coming up after just a short break. Yeah.